about the party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. This is AEW Unrestricted. I am Aubrey Edwards here with my BFF, Will Washington. How are you doing, buddy? I am doing wonderful. It's a great time. It's, uh, I, I couldn't be happier right at this very moment as a both somebody in professional wrestling and as a fan of professional wrestling. Right? God, it's so good. I was just having a thought the other day. Have you been at AEW for a year yet? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, wow. One, congrats. Two, now that it's been a year... What are you most grateful for? Cool. The obvious answer is like Tony, not just for giving me the opportunity, but like I have a great relationship with Tony Khan and we have great conversations and I am truly thankful to consider Tony a friend. You know what though? Honestly, it is being around a lot of the names that I've been a fan of my entire wrestling life and I am so grateful for that. Like there are times, there was a time I, I won't fully go into detail, but I was sitting with Brian Danielson one day and we were talking about something and it led in a roundabout way. And I finally just decided to ask a story I'd been curious about pretty much for like the last 10 years. And like, it was something that happened in professional wrestling on TV. And I was like, I always wanted to know the story behind this. And so Mm -hmm. I just asked him and he just told me. And I was like, you know what? That finally makes sense. It completely makes sense. I now have context to this entire thing. And this is something that... I can now rest assured knowing that I know for the rest of my life. And it's like one of those cool things that I'm incredibly grateful for. But no, just honestly, just the opportunity to get to look, I spend a lot of my time thinking about what's next. I never mm-hmm. like, you know, I've, I've had some really it's hard to enjoy the moment. It's hard to enjoy the moment, right? You know, uh, a few weeks ago, I had a segment. Uh, it was a, a contract signing. Uh, and I was really happy with the way it turned out. And I was really happy with how everything went with that and then as soon as it was over like we hit the light on dynamite and i go god what do i do next (laughs) it's like my magnum (laughs) opus i'm done (laughs) i was like i was like how do we top that but literally i then spent the next day working on some new stuff and i felt like uh, what we followed up with was just good but uh that was just one of those things where i'm just grateful to get to work with the guys I get to work with, with the gals I get to work with. I've made some really, really great friends. Um, you were one of them. Mm. And no, I just, this has been a great year. And, and I'm glad you asked. Uh, you kind of shocked me with that. But I had to check the calendar and I'm like, yeah, right at this point, I will have been at a year. I started May 3rd. Yes, I will have been here a year. Damn. I'm, I'm also grateful for you. I'm also grateful for Tony. Just as a fun side note, like when both of my cats unfortunately passed away at the end of last year, I had a couple people send me flowers. He sent me flowers for each cat and a handwritten note, uh, which I don't know how he did that because he's in Florida and I'm in Seattle. And somehow that happened. <laughs> he's, he's so incredibly thoughtful. But like on top of that, it's like he's creating this awesome environment where all of us get to like just work hard and do our best and be to push ourselves and we get to bring in all of this new talent every now and then that continues to push ourselves even more. Like I didn't know that I could be the person I am until I joined AEW. And now I have all these awesome opportunities to perform at Wembley and in front of all of these crowds all over the world and all this crazy stuff. Like I used to make video games and now I yell at people for a living. (laughs) And it's like, that's so absolutely incredible to think about it in the grand scheme of things. So we've got so many awesome people at AEW that just make all of our lives better. Yes, we do. Including, who are we talking to today? <laughs> we are joined by the one, the only, the aerial assassin. One of the hottest names in AEW, coming off of AEW Dynasty. And my mom's favorite wrestler, by the way. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Well, and coming off of AEW Dynasty, we're talking about one of the figureheads, one of the faces of this dynasty, this new era of AEW. We're talking about the aerial assassin, Will Ospreay. Will, thanks for being with us. How is everyone doing today? Wonderful. It's morning for you guys, isn't it? Yeah, it's technology is great because it allowed us to like do this while Will is still across the pond and the other Will and I are still stateside. I'm actually super impressed that you've 
Will Osprey. I'm going to have to be using a lot of last names during this, I guess. Oh, I, I have well, to say, no, this is the, the bane of my existence at work, by the way. <laughs> Will like, Hobbs, Will Osprey, Will Washington. <laughs> yeah, we, we had this match to talk about, but in the battle of wills we did a few weeks ago between Will Osprey and Will Hobbs, I spent all day sitting in a creative meeting and somebody's talking about Will, and I'm like, well, which one? Are you talking about me? Or are you talking about Osprey? Or are you talking about Hobbs? Now we're at a point where we have to just use last names at this point. You can I think- call me Bill if you want. Bill. <laughs> Young Billy, yes, <laughs> Billy Goat. <laughs> oh, because you got old Bill. Old we Billy got Gun. Big Bill. Uh, got yeah, we got Big Bill. Bill. We got Billy Gun. Oh, fuck! Like so many bills now. <laughs> oh my God! What are we gonna do? I don't know. We're gonna come up with new new nicknames, I guess, for this. I don't know. But I'm just super impressed that you have chosen to stay in the UK after signing with AEW. Because as someone who chose to stay in the spot where they have like an existing life and they've planted roots. Because of that, you have to put up with super long flights every week. I have an incredible amount of respect for you because at the time that I'm drinking my morning coffee, you are eating dinner at the time that we're recording this podcast. So congrats to you, man. What has life been like adjusting to crazy time changes? I prefer it. I'll be honest with you. I'm doing real well with it. I time my sleeps on the plane. I get up. I move around a little bit. I have a conversation with everyone. I like if someone's awake, I go, what film are you watching, mate? And then I just have a little conversation with some guy called Rupert is, is real nice. Like I don't, I, don't, I don't mind it. Like you got to remember like for me doing the flights from Japan and back, that was like 15 hours. And sometimes I would go 15 hours over there, stay for about like 36 hours and then come back. Oh. Mate, I, I, honestly, I don't mind it. It's not the worst thing in the world for me. So me now adjusting to it. And then every now and again, when there's a pay-per-view, I'll just might as well stay the week. So I'll just, yeah. I'll go bother Kyle. He owes me for all the years that he used to live with me. So, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> He's going to hang out in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, he mentioned that before when we talked to him. So you, you've basically been kind of rooming with him when you're when you're here, right? Yeah, him and Davis and uh, Shola Umino, who's the new fan, like, they all stay around my house when uh, the pandemic kicked in. So I looked after them all. I had no problem doing it. They're all my boys. I love them dearly. So it, it wasn't like... At no point were they like being overbearing or too much or like they were in my space. Like we all loved one another dearly. So it was just, it was always good. And there's a bunch of stories that we could never tell. So <laughs> they're the best times, eh? It's unrestricted, but it's not that unrestricted. <laughs> it's as unrestricted as you want it to be. There we go. I leave, I leave all the stories up in that my ass. At my ass. <laughs> That's a probably a good way to live life, honestly. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to talk about the start in AEW. You got to come in in a very unique way. Uh, I want to start with that experience. What was that experience like prior to actually signing? And did that help kind of lay the foundation for this being your choice? Oh, yeah, mate. Like, I mean, TV style wrestling is way different to what I was used to in New Japan. Like, I mean, with New Japan, you show up to the venue, stretch out, figure out what you're going to do strategy wise and go out there and go wrestle. I guess with uh, the, the TV style wrestling, you have so many things to take into consideration and like, once again, I've always said wrestling is a little bit of like a concert, right? So the audience are your main instrument. I can't even remember how long it's been, but like the last three years in Japan, I didn't have any instruments. Like the crowd were dead silent. So then like when you'd come over and like learn how to adjust from it, it was always nice. And it gave me an idea of what to expect with American style wrestling and American TV wrestling. So I liked it. And the fact that I got to work guys so high up in the car. Like, I mean, I got to work with an Orange Cassidy, got to work with Jericho, got to work with Kenny. Like, they're the, the who's who of the elite, really. So, like, I, I personally, like, I relish the challenge and getting to know I come here now, I have more of a better understanding of what it actually takes to make it to the top here. There's so many of those matches that, before we even got the graphic, that are really memorable. But I was so grateful I got to work with you at Wembley against Chris Jericho, which I'm sure for you was an absolutely incredible experience. What was that like going back to Wembley or going to your home country and performing at Wembley? I honestly cannot tell you enough how much that moment meant to me, man. Like, I, once again, I wasn't employed by AEW. I'm, I'm a complete outsider. They just had a partnership with New Japan. I got the call saying that I'd like to be, like, they'd like me to be part of Wembley. And, like, you know, I me, mean, I was just probably thinking I'd be in a battle royal. That'd be fun. And it turns out I'm representing the first world champ who's like generally like a guy that I grew up with idolizing and watching and like have so much respect for. So to be put in that position and, and like in a prominent position as well, is like guys like Kenny Omega were in like six man tags. Like, do you know what I mean? So like I was in a position as a singles wrestler and uh, the day before I was wrestling in Rev Pro, 
where they done one of their, I, I don't know if it was their largest attendance, but I, I think it was about like 4,000 people there. So it's not even five fucking percent. It's not even five percent of what was in Wembley. So then my mind started playing tricks on me. I was thinking like, none of these people are even going to know who I am. Like I've traveled up and down the UK numerous of times, so many times, but like every single time like you might wrestle in front of a new person for the first time. I can't tell you how amazing it was to the moment that elevators start hitting like that da -da 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 -da, and people like reacted and I could hear them and you're like, you know, they know the song. And then as you're walking down, like you're hearing row after row after row as you're walking, they're singing the song. They're going like, oh my God, you know the words? So, <laughs> and then you're looking up and fireworks are shooting over the top of you and you're just like, it's not some mad little dream, is it? Like, <laughs> There's crazy professional wrestlers that have made like way more money, are way more famous than I have ever been. And they've never wrestled in Wembley Stadium. Mm -hmm. I look like I work in Tesco's or a supermarket. <laughs> Here I am wearing my Assassin's Creed jacket. I've got my flag draped over. And all of a sudden now I'm, I'm a professional wrestler and all of these people know my existence. They know the reputation that, that precedes me. And I got to live out a dream of, saying that I'm one of the best professional wrestlers in the world and I got to prove it. I didn't have a contract, but like that's the trust that Tony had in me to go out there, not not screw him over in one of the biggest events that AEW has ever done, the biggest event AEW has ever done, not screw him over, not like, not behave like an arsehole, just go out there and show him what professionalism actually is. Just being a part of that team, it was, it was incredible. I can't, I can't find the words. It was like a movie, mate. Thinking about it from that same perspective of, because that was how we felt about the entire product, right? Where it's like, uh, you know, we travel around the country, we travel pretty much every part of the United States. And it's like little by little, we see little pockets of who knows what AEW was, but then to travel to that part of the world and all of a sudden see that, oh my God, AEW has, all of these people have all come from all different parts of Europe to come see this show and they all know who I am. And yeah, that, that's gotta be an incredible feeling. It's honestly incredible. Like the gratitude that I have for anyone that's like, if you bought a ticket to see me or if you're even like, you didn't even know who I was and you just saw the British flag, you went, oh hey, boy. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> even if you didn't like that, like the, the gratitude that I have for AEW and all the AEW fan base for coming out and supporting a true alternative, like the, the first wrestling company to run Wembley Stadium, what, like 30 years to, to be able to do that. That speaks volumes of where AEW is. Like, no one would have had the balls to run Wembley. Like, and on a grand scale, you could have put whatever logo up there, but no one had the balls. But Tony had the balls because he believes in his roster. He believes in the guys that are putting their bodies on the line to give every fan that has just enjoyed professional wrestling something just to crave and something to be excited for. And, like, the fact that he's doing it again this year, and this time I'm actually part of the company, man. Like this is, hey. um, I'm so excited just to be a part of it. I'm looking forward to it, whoever I'm going to be wrestling, because it, it's just one of those things where like, I look at what I did with Jericho and I think that was amazing, but I know I can top it. That's great. I, uh, I, I am highly, highly looking forward to, again, you know, we've got uh, All In coming up in Wembley here very soon. It's, it's like right around the corner. Every time, you know, I was thinking back in December, like, oh, that's a long way off. And all of a sudden it feels like it's nope. just right around the corner. And nope. <laughs> Come and get your tickets. Go and get your tickets now. If there's any British people that are listening to this, go buy your tickets. It's down the road. I'll get on the underground with you some. <laughs> AEWTix.com, <laughs> you know this there man will be there, and uh, I, I have a feeling that he's going to be doing some incredible stuff on that you show. You have a feeling, Mr. I Work in Creative. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, you know. It, but the, the other thing I wanted to talk about was just before All In, you also wrestled Forbidden Door. Yes. And you had a match with uh, one Kenny Omega. And a man you were quite familiar with, a man that you had really had a rivalry with that went on for years prior to AEW, uh, as far as just social media alone, you guys taking shots at each other. No, honestly, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's hard, isn't it? Because, like, the respect that I do have for Kenny, and the story goes, when he left New Japan to form AEW, he took mm -hmm. me and Jay to one side, and he said how much he cares about New Japan and that you guys have got to be the standard bearer of it. You guys have got to, to take the flag and you have to run with it. 
I idolize Kenny. Like he's the man, especially if you if you followed any of his stuff during that golden age in New Japan, like no one could touch Kenny. So then to get his rub and to get like him being like, you can do it, I believe in you. And then for him to just like, I, I felt like I was doing it, man. Like, especially as a junior heavyweight, like he left. You have no idea how hard it is to be promoted as a junior heavyweight. And I was putting New Japan Cup, I was putting a G1 Climax. I I'm the only guy to do like the Cup, the Super Juniors, the G1 Climax and the Junior Tag League all in one calendar year. No one else has done that. It's just me. And that's just a junior. And then the pandemic kicked in, which was hell. And I don't even want to like tell, like that was the worst thing that can ever happen to New Japan. It, it messed up a bunch of the foreigners that were over there. But yet still with our hands shackled together, thrown at the bottom of the ocean, I somehow still managed to breathe life into New Japan somehow. I was able to put on these amazing matches in flipping silence. Like, the crowd weren't allowed to cheer. It was... That was it. Like, doing 46-minute matches in just this, it, it rips your soul apart for what professional wrestling is because it, it is a concert. It's about performing, like, back and forth with one another. And to have him who has never been under those situations, who has never been locked in a room for two weeks with a window that opened this much. And just to be in that room with all of your thoughts and everything that's dark in your side, you know, everyone's got mental health issues these days. Everybody's like struggling. And to be locked in a room in Japan, where sometimes you weren't even allowed Uber Eats, for God's sake. So you were just given these bento boxes and hope, hope you enjoy sushi. Like sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it was like real rough on guys. And to have him, and it wasn't just him, there were other AEW wrestlers, but he was a prominent one because he was there, he lived it, and he understood. But, like, no one could understand this. Yet, somehow, we still managed to find a way of breathing. We still managed to find a way of kicking and screaming. And for him to belittle my work, I just, I've never looked at him the same. I never will look at him the same. I've lost all types of respect for him. I don't like him as a human being. In, in terms of, like, Wait, like he, he was my wall when Wrestle Kingdom came around like I've got no problem saying it it whooped my ass man like it was 80% him and 20% me so by the time Forbidden Door came around it was in his back garden man like it was in Canada in front of his hometown man like I just wanted to antagonize him I just wanted him to feel like even a fraction of what I felt during Tokyo though man like I was the hometown boy I don't like people are happy to see him but people respect the fact that I stayed the course and that I breathed life in this place when he just he buried the company, man. Like, on numerous times on being the elite with the Bucks, I've just got no respect for him. I have no respect for the guy whatsoever now. But, like, do I respect his ability? Of course I do. But him as a human being, I couldn't give a toss about him anymore. Damn. <laughs> tell me how you really feel, Will. Tell me, um, tell me, oh, I don't want to say the line, but just like, <laughs> would, would you guys, would anyone accept that? I see exactly where you're coming from. I was not in the, in the same situation you were in, so I can't speak to it. But yeah, I mean, it's it's an incredible thing to see what you did at New Japan and the success that they have coming out of the pandemic because it was rough on everybody. Everybody in wrestling. Like, all of a sudden, everything is just kind of like... Meow. I actually want to talk more about your time at New Japan, but we got to take a break real quick here on AEW Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted, Will, Will, and Aubrey. I'm the only one not named Will on this call. But we're having lots of fun chats with one of our newest signees and newest editions of All Elite Wrestling. I say new like it was yesterday, but like you feel like you've been here since the beginning with how much you guys All Elite Graphic in November. So like even that. That was like yesterday. Yeah, that was like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea where I'm flying week to week. Whatever. It's just like I still write, accidentally write 2022 on everything. So whatever. Screw it. Uh, we talked a little bit about your time in New Japan and, you know, through the pandemic and all of that. But you and I actually had a conversation recently where I had said you were in New Japan longer than I have been in wrestling. And eight years is a long time. What initially brought you to Japan? Because you were still very early in your career, I think, at that point. Yeah, I mean, Revolution Pro Wrestling would do joint shows with New Japan, uh, like Global Wars. And mm -hmm. um I just got lucky, man. Like, AJ left. I, I wrestled Okada on a show in Reading in back in, like, 2015. And you just couldn't have, like, put, like, a better puzzle piece together. I had, I was against Okada. So he was the world champ. I had Gator Ringside, who was the booker. I had Taigo Hattori, who was the guy in the office. And I had Tanahashi peeking back through the curtain going, this kid's great. Like, so I, I had, like, the perfect formula. 
And at first it was just going to be like, uh, we're going to bring you in for the Super Juniors, which I was absolutely fine with. That was my dream. Like, I just wanted to go wrestle in Japan and do the Super Juniors. But then AJ left, Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson left and Shinsuke Nakamura left. So there was this big hole and they needed a new junior heavyweight star. And then in comes this pillock. And then uh, they was like, and I, I was always like real thankful because AJ put me over to uh, the office and said like, you should get Will to come in. And that's my hero, man. Like AJ was like the sole reason I started wrestling. I joined New Japan in 2016. I, I often forget it so much, man. I was there for eight years of my life. I still feel like a 22-year-old now, but like I'm not. I'm 30 and I feel my knees and my back. All the time. <laughs> you know, again, you talked about that being a, a, the bit of the renaissance period for, for New Japan. And, uh, and really, you know, that was a period where Kenny Omega and Okada and all of those guys really were kind of the centerpiece and the, the focal point of New Japan Pro Wrestling. But you were creating so much buzz. Did you really feel at that moment what you were starting to accomplish? I felt like I was learning the trade at first because once again, like when you step into New Japan, it is a different territory. I'm not just wrestling just to get gifts and clips now. I am learning the trade of what professional wrestling is and learning a business. And not only that, but like learning bits about myself, like learning how to be a man. I have no problem saying it, but like I really struggled because I feel like I was, I was searching for who I was myself and like, my opinion should have been heard. But the reality was no one gives a fuck about my opinion. I should just get my mouth shut all the time. And I, I wouldn't have ended up in a lot of the trouble that I was in. But I feel like I, I found out so much about myself, learning from my mistakes and learning like, I, 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 like how I, I messed up. And I, I let a lot of fans down with my behavior and my immaturity that by the time that 2019 started coming in, I learned the trade of what professional wrestling was. And like, I wrestled guys like Shibata and Kushida and Hiromu, Okada. But then it was like, Kenny was rumored on leaving and they were edging me towards the heavyweights. So they were like, seeing that I was almost like dominating the junior heavyweight division. And they were like, okay, like he's got the size, he's tall, like see what you can do against our heavyweight division. And I was like, I was swimming in these waters. Like to my surprise as well, I was, I was doing very well. I, and it was when I wrestled Ibushi at Wrestle Kingdom and I won the Never Open Way title. And then it was just from there, just plain sailing. I really found my footing in it. It was just a nice, slow rise. Like 2019 was incredible for me. And I was still a junior heavyweight. I think the first time I actually was introduced to you was your match with Ricochet back in 2016. <laughs> Which was like, at the end of the day, like super controversial because all the old guard and wrestling came through and was like, this is not how you do it. I'm like, I don't know. That looks pretty dope, man. <laughs> Nick, I think Nick Wayne actually said like, oh, it's a match that got me into wrestling. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh man. Doesn't that make you feel old all of a sudden? You're like, ugh. Honestly, yeah. Man, it started to like, a couple of the lads have even said like, if you look around, you can see like the, the influence that you've had on a few lads. And it's so humbling, man. It is honestly, it does take my breath away a little bit because on I. A lot of the time, I do generally think, I've just been doing stuff over in England and Japan, like two small islands in comparison to America. I mean, if you put England and Japan together, it's still not the size of Texas, for God's sake. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. the fact that like I've done all this within New Japan and the British Indies and just dipping my toes into America, like it, it's so, it blows my mind. It, it really just takes my breath away. Like how, how cool this situation is that I've had, influence on like a, a younger generation because i still feel like i am in that younger generation i'm only 30 you are and uh again that's why when we talk about the future of the business we talk about the future of AEW. you know uh, in a lot of ways it very much feels like you're the present but there's still so much more to go speaking of which uh you know we, we it, when everybody talks about will osprey they talk about will osprey the in-ring performer and as they should i think there's a lot you bring to the table there and that's uh there's no question about that mm -hmm. But one of the things that I think at least initially catches people off guard is how good of a promo you truly are. Oh, my God. I want to talk about your confidence in your promo ability, first off, and where you feel like that developed. I've never been a good promo. I'll be honest with you. I've never been like... That's a lie. That, that, what is this? <laughs> no, honestly, like, if you look at, like, some of the stuff that I did in New Japan, like, this is something that I do credit New Japan for. Like, after a match, like, as soon as you're done, so, like, you're, you're going to be pissing blood, you're going to be, like, dying from exhaustion. They're like, comment. Like, <laughs> so you, I want to thank my mum. Like, you know what I mean? But, like, half the time, you're, like, dying. So they would force you in a weird way to do promos. And um, 
it's not really instructed like what you can and can't say. So you would just sometimes ramble. And a lot of the time I, I just didn't really know what to say. It's only now, like, honestly, like after the pandemic, I, I went home and I just hang out with my mates that were down the pub that are like clearly on some type of drugs going like down the local English pubs down there. And I'm just, I just hang out with them. And this is just who I am. I'm just a, a charming person. I'm everyone's mate. Like I, I get along with everyone. I just, I like getting everyone involved as well. Like I know that's one of the things that I need to like focus on the camera. And this is where um, I, I have ADHD. And like, it's one of those things you can tell because when I'm kind of pro, I can't make eye contact with people. And it's, I know like I need to work on it, but it's just something I've had for like flipping ages, not realized about it. I only found out that I had ADHD when I was in like 2019 in Japan. So like straight away you're going, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Like you're like, I'm so impulsive. I get it now. I so said, they're the things I struggle with, but just, this is just how I talk. This is how I talk. This is how I like, if I was in a, a, a room full of my mates there and they were like, oh, tell the story of like when you beat up the guy down the road. And I was like, oh yeah. Like that's, this is how I talk. I can't help it. But like, I guess there's two things I put it down to. A, I'm a very charming man. My mum raised me right. My mum raised me to have manners and just look after the people around me. I'll happily walk your man across the road if you need to. But if you want me to beat up the guy over there, I can. I'll do it. But like, and I feel like the other side is, I think generally people are actually happy to see somebody come into AEW and is actually happy to be at work. I'm actually generally excited to be at work. This is great. And I don't think people realise the opportunities we have and like, once upon a time, this didn't exist. It was just WWE and Japan and Ring of Honor. That was it. And like a DNA for me, like coming in here, like I was never going to go to WWE. Like, I mean, there was obviously, there was talk about it, but just the position that I'm in right now with my family, I don't want to move. I don't want to like, I don't want to relocate. My kids just started school. If you generally like dug into like my missus and like her journey within pro wrestling, it's like, it's talked about through our country, but just like, it hasn't reached anywhere else. But like, my main focus is making sure that she's all right and that she and my family and her family and her social circle are, are within reach. Like I can endure the travel. I've been doing it for bloody ages. For me now, it's just like I get to come in here and I'm on I'm on national TV and I generally thought I'd never be in this position. I I, I thought I was just going to be the kid in Japan for the rest of my life, and I was I was happy with that. I was more than happy to be the kid in Japan, but this opportunity came up. And I just couldn't turn it down because every single time I've come here, I've really enjoyed myself. And it's just one of those days where I was like, what could I do if I was a part of this full time? And that and it excites me. It excites me for all the guys that I could wrestle. It excites me because the fan base that have like heard rumors about like what I could do. And on the first day that I come here, I knock it out of the park with Takeshita. I run out, I grab the ball and bring it back for him and go, go set me up for another one. I'm just happy to be here. I feel like that translates to my promos. It translates to who I am as a person. I don't know. I'm a very happy person. It takes a lot to fuck me off. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's one of the reasons why you are so great at promos is because so much of your authentic self comes through. I know that every time you're in the ring with a microphone, I'm hearing Will Ospreay. I'm hearing the guy that I ran into at the gym who called me a little chicken pot pie that morning. Oh. Like, <laughs> it's You feel like you know you and you're rooting for you. And I think that's why you have such a great promo. It's such a unique style, but you're not hiding who you are and you're making sure that your love for wrestling is known in every word you're saying and your love for AEW is known in every word you're saying. So I think that's why you're a great promo. Yeah, I'm just I'm gonna make down the pub. Like, you know, and that's the funny bit. If I saw any of the fans out in a pub, I'd really be like, right, first round's on me, let's have a chat. Yeah. I'd love to sat around and talk with people. I just like it. I'm a weird person, I know. I mean, you're asking Rupert on the plane what he's watching on the show, so clearly this is just a thing that you do. <laughs> he was watching Batman. Which one? The one with Robert Pattinson in it. I like it. Oh, the Batman, mm. yeah. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, I, wa I watched it in Japan for the first time. I could tell you some funny stories about that. <laughs> oh, man, I'm, I'm so excited. Anyway, we've got more coming up here on AEW Unrestricted. Let's take a break real quick, and then we'll come back and chat more with Will Ospreay. AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey Edwards is there. Will Washington's here. But most importantly, Will Ospreay 
is here and we're talking about all things we're talking about his journey to aew um his arrival in aew and i want to touch on something that you kind of finished the last segment with revolution with Takeshita. Mm -hmm. you came in and had an incredible match with one of the best performers that AEW has and one that I think everybody kind of knew, like literally as we're putting the card together, everybody's talking about, please don't make me follow Will Ospreay and Takeshita. <laughs> it was literally the question of the day. Every match I had was like, I'm not after Will and Takeshita, right? It's like, nope, nope, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wanted to follow you guys because everybody Nobody. knew what was, was going to happen. I had a friend at that show. I'm going to tell the story really quick. Shout out to my friend, Heidi. Heidi's fairly new to professional wrestling as a whole. But when she came away from that show with her first real wrestling experience, the only thing she could talk about was how awesome Will Ospreay and Kanosuke Takeshita was. Uh, yes. so, so just the idea that somebody could see this for the first time and experience that. What is that like? What is that? You know, what goes into uh, creating something like that? The person that I'm in the ring opposite. Like, I, listen, I could wrestle a broomstick if you want me to. I don't think it'll be that, that good. Like, I mean, I could do my best. It'd still be match of the year. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give it a great Osco. It's sharp, <laughs> but like, I'll, I'll do my best. But there's like the guy that I'm opposite with is like, dude, it's Kesha. I've been a fan of his for like ages. First time I saw him was like 2019 over in DDT. I straight away knew it. I was just like, this guy is incredible. He's like one of the best wrestlers that I've ever seen. I've been a fan of him since. I just never thought we'd ever wrestle one another. It was only when AEW came in and they got him and we started working together in, in, within the Callis family. I was like, this is great, but like the only way we're going to get better is if we test each other, if we wrestle one another. And obviously that idea was thrown around for my debut. I just couldn't think of a better way to debut because it was just like, all right, 25 minutes, what you got? And it was just like, you ain't seen nothing yet, bro. <laughs> oh <my laughs> so I, just, I just went out there with him and I just think we both, it was just like a shake hands afterwards and just whatever happens, happens. But fuck me, my arse after that oh. match, mate. I, had, <laughs> I, I will say it till the cows come home. That is the most painful thing that has ever happened to me in a match ever. But like, not enough to stop the match. But just my ass was hurting so much. It was like flipping blue afterwards. <laughs> but for me, like having all that reaction, having all that expectation, delivering, even in the, the pain that I was in, going backstage, having this giant ice pack and this weird drink that looked like piss. And I'm the like, electrolytes, so yeah. But they're so lovely, actually. And then <laughs> laying on the, the flipping table, crying like, oh, my ass hurts so much. And then I felt someone grab my hand. And he went, Mr. Osprey. And I looked up, and it was Ric Flair. I was like, oh, <laughs> like, stand back up again, like agony. Like, my ass is killing me. And they're like, yes, sir. And he was just like, you're, the, you're everything you've said and more. And I was like, oh. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Ric Flair. I felt that for you in that moment. I was sitting at go position next to Sanjay, who was the producer on that match. We were talking about the fact that, you know, this coming Wednesday, it's going to be... Kyle Fletcher versus Will Ospreay. And, and as soon as that hit, I remember thinking, oh, there's no fucking way. There's no way that this man is going to wrestle <laughs> Kyle Fletcher on Wednesday. He ain't going to be cleared. You have no idea, man. You have no idea. I can cut my arm off. I go, it's just a flesh wound. Send me out there. <laughs> the worst part is now is that like I actually believe that. I've seen enough mm -hmm. of Will Ospreay in person to know that, yeah, you could cut his arm off. He'll still wrestle next week. And he'll put on a banger, match of the year, whatever. I'm, I'm cooked, mate. Like, I just, I just think, you know, it's possible that's that happen. Like, what, you're going to damage more of my brain? <laughs> 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 well, there's no sense. There's no feeling, bro. We've already established you're not the smartest guy. And you had to dumb down your promos for Japan. <laughs> Thick as shit, mate. But great wrestler. Fantastic wrestler. Speaking of which, for those that have ever even heard of Assassin's Creed, it's very clear that you have this, uh, it has a large influence on you with the cape, the hidden blade being your finishing move, all of these things. How has this game had an impact on you as a wrestler, as a person? Because I love hearing when someone has a game that like means that much to them. When we were training, so my trainers were Greg Burridge and Gary Vanderhorn, two UK wrestlers that you would promote uh, Lucha Britannia, which is more, more of a cabaret show than a wrestling show. It was a, a cabaret show that featured wrestling. And they would open a training school 
And when you graduate, they would just give you a gimmick. So like one kid got graduated and he was just like, okay, you're the silver lizard. And they go, well, what does the silver lizard do? And they go, oh no, you fucking figure it out. So then my gimmick was like Dark Britannico. But then like people wanted to know who the guy was underneath the mask. And once again, I look like a geezer that works in Tesco. <laughs> so they were like, you need something about you. And like, I remember getting, getting it was Assassin's Creed Revelations. Like I, after talking about me so much, I had to like, rethink with it. But I got Assassin's Creed Revelations. And the good thing about that game is that was the the third or the fourth installment of the games. Mm-hmm. This is the fourth. It was the fourth. It is the fourth, right? So, yeah. But this game harkened back to the two other games. Mm-hmm. So by the time I finished playing this game, I was like, I'm going to go play it from the beginning now. So then I played it and then I just, I was fascinated with Ezio. I was mesmerized by the way that he moved, the hidden blades, the parkour. In England, like parkour was like huge at one point. And me and my friends would travel up to London and we would like jump off of buildings and climb up shit and film ourselves doing it. So I had like a real connection with it there. So then to have a video game where it was almost like a superhero, but it wasn't a superhero and it was the hood and AJ Styles is my favorite wrestler. So I was just like, oh, the hood, like, like everything connected. So I was just like, I am Assassin's Creed. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I went out of the hoods and like the whole method behind it was Greg was just like, like you have six seconds to win a crowd over. Mm-hmm. The moment you walk through a curtain, you've got six seconds to, to really be a part of it and to really get their attention. So I, I came in with that hood and people understood, oh, he's the Assassin's Creed. Oh, like the, I get it. Okay, let, let's go with it. Let's rock and roll. So that's the reason why I wanted to like go down that route. For anybody who's going to like tweet at me and correct me, I know that Assassin's Creed Revelations is technically not part of the numbered series, but it was the fourth game released, but it's technically not fi- officially numbered. I know that. Whatever. Yeah, it's, like, it's, like three, it's one, two, Brotherhood's Revelations. Yes. There you go. Three. Yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> the Revolution was the fourth game released, but technically yes. there is Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. I know that. But anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, because you really have gotten to talk a lot about AJ Styles and his influence on you and mm-hmm. what he's meant to you as a performer. And then you also mentioned AJ Styles. Did you have much of a relationship with AJ Styles as he, when he left in 2016 in New Japan? I love telling people this story. The last time I saw AJ before he debuted in the Rumble, we were in a service day in Sydney eating chicken nuggets together. Like, that's, so that's why I was like, when he debuted, I was like, fucking hell, we were just eating chicken nuggets a little while ago. Having that, and like, AJ was on the phone to me when he was trying to, I guess the right word would be sway in making my decision of which company I, I should be going towards. And it flatters me, man, because AJ is my hero. Like, everything... I wanted to become like, I still remember it to this day, man, 14 years old. And he grabbed that top rope and jumped to the top rope and then shooting star press onto Joe and Daniels, which is crazy because I walk past them all the time in the dressing room now. I'm just like, right? stuff like that blows my mind all the time. I'm just like, you guys don't have any idea. Like you guys are in a weird way, raise this generation of kids. I am like a product of what you guys did. So then a, a relationship of like talking terms, like, do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like, He's always kept an eye on me. Mm-hmm. I feel like he's, he, even now, because I guess that's what the phone calls about, but like he, he always keeps an eye on me every now and again. But like, for me, coming here was the right thing to do. I just knew, like, coming here, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be part of, like, a, a change in the culture. If I'm working this hard, what's everyone else's excuse? Do you know what I mean? So like, mm-hmm. I just, like, I, I've got this, I've got a mad work ethic. I just want to, like, I want to give fans something to be excited about. And just, like, whenever AJ was wrestling, I watched how he worked. I watched how his style would translate through the camera and within the live audience. You could tell the man was grafting. And I think that's what I am, man. I'm a grafter at heart. I was. I, I used to work in building sites, you know what I mean? And I just like, I do people's windows and bathrooms and shit like that. That was me. I was a grafter back then. I didn't like doing it, but I still did it. But like my main graft is professional wrestling. And that's what translates to me. I want to be part of like this generation of grafters, man. I have that same feeling backstage when you're walking past guys like Samoa Joe and Christopher Daniels, and you're like, these guys were the guys. How does it feel to be the guy that kids are living up to, that kids are going to be joining AEW when you're old and frail (laughs) and nearing the end of your career, and they're going to say, you're the guy that made me want to get into professional wrestling? Honestly, that would make me so happy. I can't tell you enough, because getting to tell AJ 
how much he meant to me as a performer before he left. That means the world to me. And like, if it just could be passed on, man, like if, if there's anything that I would love people to say, just like at the end of it, I, I was a great wrestler, but just even if it was like, he's an idiot, but he's really nice. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? And that's all I care about. Do you know what I mean? Like as much as I, I, I appreciate the fans respect, that means the world to me. Right. But having the boys in the back, and the girls just go like, he's nice. Mm -hmm. Like guys like Brian, just like the work if they have and the longevity and the fact that he doesn't need to do this for fuck's sake. No, he doesn't. He just loves wrestling. And that enthusiasm is just super infectious. It infects me, man. Like it's that work ethic, the enthusiasm for what professional wrestling is. That's what I want to translate to what people see with me. Well, your enthusiasm is infectious because I'm even more excited to show up to work every week because I see the work you're putting in. I see the time of your life that you're having. And even though you might be an idiot, you are a wonderful, charming man. <laughs> oh, best. You're flattering me so much. Oh, well, I'm just so happy that you came and chatted with us today. And sorry to interrupt your dinner, but I appreciate you having a chat with us. It was great. So right, I'm going to go read a bedtime story to my boy now. Oh, that's... Oh, wonderful. Look at this family, man. I love it. Yeah, mate. But, like, but you laugh, though. I could barely read the words. He corrects me all the time. It's the funny bit where I'm like, I'm reading it, and he just goes, actually, it says this. And I'm just like, all right, I get it. I can't read. Like, <laughs> Again, charming, but an idiot. <laughs> well, thank yeah, you. mate. Thank you so much for joining us today, Will Ospreay. You can watch Dynamite Wednesdays on TBS. You can watch Rampage on Fridays on TNT and Collision on TNT on Saturdays. I'm Aubrey Edwards along with Will Washington. Listen to this podcast every Thursday. Thank you so much for listening to AEW Unrestricted. Come on, throw your hands up. Let me see you. Unrestricted. Unrestricted.